Hi everybody, thank you for having me here. Falmouth Education Foundation, thank you all for coming. My name's Corey Charles. Uh, I'm gonna be presenting tonight a few different grants that I've gotten from FEF, uh, starting back from my second year of teaching here. This is my fifth year, and I got another grant this year, which I'm very excited about. And when I've been writing my grants and all the ones that I've been using, I've been at T-Ticket School, I've been at North Falmouth School, and uh, now currently um, East Falmouth School. So many of the schools have got to experience the things that I've been doing in, um, in music. But um, here's my list. Oh, before, before my list. So <laughs> Falmouth Education Foundation has really helped me out a lot. Music can be very expensive. Um, and for us to be able to pro provide the things that go beyond what I experienced when I was in elementary school, I sat in rows of chairs and sometimes we used rhythm sticks. But <laughs> kids need more than that for music. They really, they really do to be able to experience the things that they deserve and that they should have uh, to get the appropriate education. And we give that to them here in Falmouth, and that's a big part due to what FEF does for us. So thank you um, for all those things. So I've gotten instruments, I've gotten technology, and I've gotten uh, movement accessories, which really means I got scars from them. <laughs> too. So, um, in 2014, I got 10 iPads, which um, I do a lot of the same things that Kelly was talking about uh, with uh, their equipment. We use GarageBand. We use an app called Doodle Buddy, which the kids can practice their writing music notation. And sometimes when they're when they're done or they've done a great job, they get to just kind of have some fun and create, which is actually really really important for young uh, kids to be able to just play and just enjoy themselves and do that. And a lot of them actually say, hey, look, Mr. Charles, I wrote this rhythm out. What do you think? And I said, this is great. You guys are composers. Um, in 2015, uh, I worked with Teresa Jazza and Stephanie Miles, who are other elementary music teachers, on writing a grant called All About That Bass. And every elementary school got uh, a bass xylophone and three bass bars, which are uh, single bars from a xylophone that have a very, very deep sound and you'll get to see them later in the video that I have. And that's really meant to, um, to teach that important piece of music that is the bass, and you really can't have music without that bass sound. So the kids get to experience that in a much deeper way, no pun intended. Um, in 2015, I got a mini grant for frame drums and scars, which were really used for creative movement. And the creative movement is something, again, part of the play that kids need to have, and this gives them a, another outlet besides just imagining. We get to imagine with props. Uh, Dr. Dale at East Falma School also worked with the PTO in 2015 to get us ukuleles, which uh, we got to have Tom Gu, who's a, a former music teacher in Falma, and he is wonderful. He taught our ukulele after school class, and we have, we have 12 ukuleles. Um, hanging up on the wall and they're gorgeous and they sound great and you should have heard those kids play them last year. Um, we have a couple of our ukulele, or one of our ukulele kids in the room over there. I've been, um, if you want to ask him after about what ukulele is like, he has all the answers for you. Um, sorry, Evan. <laughs> and then this year I'm getting, uh, or I, I already have my 14 Tubano drums, which are similar to the djembe drums, um, but Tubanos are they're more like, the, they're a mix between the djembes and the congas, and, um, and they're just, they're made for children to use. Um, and we're gonna be focusing on uh, our rhythmic studies, because we're learning how to read rhythms. So a lot of what we do, and you're gonna see in my video again later, some of the rhythmic work that we do with it. And we're also gonna be going into the world drumming piece. So uh, drumming in, in our world is really a big, uh, a big thing it's a big part of the music in latin america so we're going to look at uh, the different styles of playing in latin music now you can't just call latin music one thing because if you go to um if you go to mexico or if you go to venezuela or if you go to brazil they all say or they they all do have their own type of playing so we're going to look at some of those little differences in that style and then uh, we're also going to do the african drumming uh, which is a really big part of the african <coughs> culture in fact, if you go somewhere in Africa where you have children who experience drumming, the things that they do at such a young age because it's really built into their, their music making is very impressive. And they also include the movement piece, the music and the movement. So how am I doing on time? Okay, great. So 
<laughs> moving quickly. So um, all these things are something that have really led to me having my ideal music room, uh, my setup, all the things that <coughs> I really didn't have when I was a kid, and all the things that make it special and something that they actually, that they'll hopefully take with them uh, through their life. Every adult should be musical. And that's, that's really important to us in the Fountain of Public Schools. So, um, as I said before, the, the All About That Base was uh, elementary wide, so all the elementary schools have received funding in the past uh, four years from Falmouth Education Foundation. Um, and the Falmouth Music Department has the motto that music is alive in the Falmouth Public Schools, and the Falmouth Education Foundation has really truly had a major role in that. So I'd like to thank you, um, who, everyone who's involved in that, and everyone who helps. And here's my last little thing. Here's our the little video that um, the students in the past few weeks helped me put together. And um, you'll get to see the iPads being used in some photos. You'll get to see the bass xylophones and bass bars. The kids are kind of just improvising on them. And you also see some of the rhythmic work we're doing with the drums. So thank you all so much. Some of the scars, we do a lot of the rhythmic movement with scars. I'm sorry it's hard to hear what they're singing. And here's our bass xylophone that we got and our two bass bars uh, right here. Uh, there's actually a third bass bar that we didn't need for this key that we're playing. So this was actually this afternoon. These kids are just pretty much improvising on it. giant parachute scarves and we had the iPads and everything. Um, gotten a lot from FDF and uh, I'm going to continue to ask for things. <laughs> uh, I'd like to one more time just thank you everybody. Thank you all for being here and um, and really know that, that we're working hard for the children in this town to, uh, to make their education the best it can be. So thank you all. you have um, questions for those two presenters, jot them down. The question period at the end. The next category is called Robots and Con. Dustin Fout, the um, fourth grade teacher, and Tara Draper, library technology teacher from East Falmouth Elementary, are using technology to engage learners and increase skills and have fun. So let me invite them up. If you could just give us a moment. You guys sure. robots are going to actually set up. <gasps> Hello everyone, my name is Tara Draper. I am the library and technology teacher at East Town Elementary School. The uh, little howdy do that you're hearing is actually one of our robots um, getting ready to get turned on and connected to our iPads. Um, today I have with me actually some two of my current fourth grade students and one of my former fourth grade students now in fifth grade at Morris Pond, um, Evan Hoffman. Nathan Bushy and Lincoln Sawyer, and they are here to demonstrate what our robots do. At East Thomas Elementary School, we love technology, we love to do fun things with technology, and we are very fortunate that our PTO offers a before and after school enrichment program. I do the before school enrichment, 8 a.m., 
bright and early, but we had a lot of fun. Um, last year, I was very fortunate from the F uh, from SEF to receive a grant called Dash into Coding, and our grant purchased some of our awesome robots and their accessories that go with them. Dash and Dot are robots that use code, computer programming language, to create an algorithm. And an algorithm sounds like a really fancy word. It's actually a series of steps that you use to get to an end result. Same as making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. That's an algorithm. Our students are using algorithms to have their robots create different things that they would like them to create. If you guys want to have those we'll start moving around, go for it. Oh, maybe my Bluetooth, Bluetooth might not be on. Might have forgotten an extra. Uh, <laughs> might have forgotten an extra iPad at school. <laughs> might be on my phone right now. <laughs> so, oh, let me go back. Hold on. Okay, so we have our Dash and Dot robots, and they are really cool. They're a lot of fun. My goal with asking for a robot was really to have our students use a, to be able to see their code actually create something in, in real life. There's a lot of amazing programs that are available on our school iPads, on different websites out there that we are able to do code and see something happen, whether it's Angry Birds or just a fun game, we're able to see that. But we didn't have anything available to us where we could actually physically see it happen in front of our eyes. This grant was able to afford us that opportunity to have our robots actually create something. We have 12 pairs of dash and dots, in addition to 12 accessory kits that go with them. We have everything from xylophones, so some mornings you would actually hear the students trying to create songs and do music. We have everything except the launchers. The kids have asked for launchers. <laughs> I have said no. Let's keep our eyes. That's what I tell them. And they agree with me. But we're, we have a lot, a lot, a lot of fun. So like I said, we have before school, school enrichment. So 8 o'clock in the morning, two mornings a week, you'll see um, third and fourth graders in the library creating code. They come because they want to be there, which is amazing. And they're really learning that computer language and coding and being able to think in a different way, not this is what you have to do, this is what your end result has to be. I like to give them the freedom of really doing what they would like to do. Approximately 50 third and fourth grade students at East Falmouth were able to partake in our enrichment course last year and I'm really excited once we get enrichment going again this year, we'll have even more students be able to use the robot. We are also really fortunate in that um, between with some parent donations and our PTO helping to begin to create a maker space in our library, which the students will be able to create all different things with all different things. Sort of beginning our process with that. Kristen's gonna talk about her maker space more later. And our Dash and Dot robots are part of that. So this is an example of what one of our students actually created with one of the apps that are on our school iPads. And this, what he would do is he would drag and drop what he wanted his robot to create and we can actually see what he did. Part of the grant was we had the students show their classmates what they wanted their robot to complete. So kids were singing. And he actually figured out how to record his own voice.
that's just an example of one of the projects that they did. But I actually like you guys. You guys want to come up here? Mm. Okay, don't worry about Lincoln. <laughs> just, just leave it. Okay, so Evan, Nathan, and Lincoln. Do you guys have anything you'd like to say? Come on. Um, well, I had a lot of fun. I learned a lot too. So, yeah. <laughs> Dash and Dot are really fun. So, uh, same as both of them, and they're just fun to play around with. Did you learn anything? Um. All right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. When I first asked my wife any suggestions for this evening, she said, don't yell at the crowd through the mic. <laughs> so, am I yelling at anybody right now? <laughs> all good, all right, fantastic, thank you very much. Um, first of all, thank you to all of the donors and everybody who's part of the FEF Foundation. You folks are absolutely amazing for taking the time out of your day and your money to support the students of Falmouth and helping them make their educational experience even more than it could be without your guys' help. So thank you all very, very much for all that you do. My project that I proposed to the FEF, um, I titled it Chrome for Khan. But first I have to give you a little bit of an explanation of why I chose to do this project and then a little bit about what Khan Academy is. I've been a teacher for about nine years now, and teaching math has always been a mighty challenge, as it probably is for all teachers. When you're set in front of a class of 17, 18, 19, 20 students, whatever it is, you don't actually know exactly what all of those students know about mathematics. You do your best. You stand up there, you teach your lesson, whether it's multiplication, division, fractions, not an easy one. However, most of the time, after your lesson, you look out over your students and think, did they get it? Do they know what I am talking about? As it so happens, usually, there's a chunk of them you know absolutely did not. Some smile at you and nod, and you think they might have got it. Others, you know that they've got it, absolutely. However, about three years ago now, I was standing up in front of a crew of students who were fabulous. They wanted to learn. They liked being in the classroom. They were well behaved, except during math time. It was one day I was up there teaching fractions, doing my best. I was like, gosh, this is a great lesson. I know what I'm going to teach. I can explain fractions like the best of them. About 15 minutes in, Johnny was poking Bill. Bill was nudging the guy next to him. Their eyes were looking up at the sky like this. And I'm looking at him like, guys, this is great. I, I, I know what I'm doing. You're getting this. And they all look at me like, what are you talking about, man? And it kind of hit me that after so many years that this is still not working. Why can't these children understand such a great lesson. Is it my lesson is horrible? Is it I'm a bad teacher? I didn't think so. So I began to think of what is actually going on here. It came to my mind, maybe they don't have the right background. Maybe in third grade, they didn't learn everything that they needed to. And I thought about it, I was like, well, you know what? Of course, how could they? As a teacher, you go out and you correct your math books, you go around, you see who did well, while many of the other students kind of sit there and wait to see if their problem is correct or not. They don't have the immediate feedback. They actually don't know if they have truly mastered a topic or not. But because we have to move forward and we have to teach content to students, the lesson goes on, the school day goes on, and on and on and on. 
The students who are able to get it, they do. The ones who don't, they do their best. The ones who don't at all, well, they are left in the dust. Nowadays, I don't believe that has to be the way of teaching anymore. And with that, I want to explain a little bit of what Khan Academy is and why it works. Khan Academy is an online tool that was that is set up for students to be able to work at mathematics from the very, very beginning. Starting with the basic idea of what's the number one? What's one plus one? Okay, you know it's two? You've got that? Let's go on to the next skill. So on and so forth throughout all the grade levels. And along this path, the students know that they know it or not. They're given immediate feedback. If they got a problem right, sweet. They know they got it right. They do it again. They get it right again. They do it five times in a row, and all of a sudden, they've mastered it. They know they have this skill down. They know they're ready to move on to the next skill. And the teacher knows as well. OK, thank you very much. So what this actually creates is a completely differentiated classroom experience. This is a picture of a student working on Khan Academy. Her Chromebook has the problem. She does her math on her whiteboard and inputs the problem onto the computer, which then gives her that immediate feedback whether she has gotten it right or wrong. If she's got it wrong, well, she has the opportunity to get a hint, this little button here, watch a video that'll explain what it's about, and then be able to move forward. If all else fails, they can throw their hand up, and I'm floating around the classroom looking for kids that need that extra help, looking for those kids that need that extra feedback to be able to move forward with their mathematics. This is what a real classroom looks like. This is my class so far this year. This is early math, K through two. Lots of students still working on those basic skills. That's fine, they're at their own level. They know where they're at, they know where they need to do to move forward. This is in the third grade. All students, all different levels, this is what they truly know. This is the fourth grade progress so far this year. One student almost finished with fourth grade. He's ready to move on and on and on and upward. The sky's the limit for this student. The rest of the students, they have the time, they have the resources they need, and the help they need to continue to move forward with their math mission. With this technology and with the help of Khan, last year, I was able to move my students through the fourth grade curriculum while covering everything behind it. Knowing that all of my students had the foundation to move forward with their mathematics led my class to be 16 out of 17 students proficient on the PARC test. That's an amazing feat. Beyond that of being proficient on standardized tests, these students have the confidence and the belief in themselves that they can do mathematics, that they can move forward, that they can be successful in math, which above all is of the most importance. All right, thank you very much. All right, for my last minute, just one more word, and then I had one of my students come up and talk a little bit about how she feels using Khan Academy this year and how perhaps it is maybe helping her. One more thing I would like to say before I hand the microphone to her, however, is let us imagine for just one second if every student in Falmouth was given the opportunity to be met in mathematics at their personal level and then given the tools to move forward, what would this do? What if the whole CAPE and all the students on it had the ability to do that? What if all the students in Massachusetts and in the United States had the opportunity to move forward at their own level every single day? Not only would this create a plethora of math geniuses, it would create a huge amount of students that believe in themselves and know that they can be successful and could absolutely change the course of education for so many of our children. With that, can Sarah please come up and tell us a little bit about how she feels about this idea? Uh, 
that have supported this and allowed this to take place and happen and are working to move forward with this. So thank you to everybody. Thank you so much to Tara and Dustin and their East Found friends. The next category is called Library as Makerspace. Um, and I want to acknowledge that Sarah Hines, who is building a makerspace at Lawrence School, wanted to be here um, tonight but couldn't be. So a special shout out even before she begins to Kristen Bergeron, who's carrying the makerspace <laughs> load as a solo act. <laughs> Tell us all about it. I even went to observe a few schools who had maker spaces at the time, and I decided I desperately wanted to have a maker space in my school. And I wrote the grant, and I checked my email constantly <laughs> to make sure that I wasn't getting any emails that I needed to provide more information or anything. I was like so desperate to get the grant, so I was beyond thrilled to be able to have the opportunity to put this into our school. So let me tell you what a makerspace is first. The easiest way to describe a makerspace is to describe what a maker is. A maker is someone who creates with their hands. You can be using any material, any means to do that. So if you are creating, you are a maker. So in that term, a makerspace is a space where you can make. So it's for your maker. Um, it can be, the materials can be varied. It depends on what your passion is, what your interest level is, sorry. Um, it can be more focused on arts, it can be more focused on technology. The, the, the um, ceiling is endless. So I decided to get started in it and have a variety of materials. I'm gonna go over some of the materials I have there, explain what they are so you can get a vision of what our makerspace is. So. I decided that we needed to have some technology. Our kids now are really passionate about it, but I didn't want to just put technology in the kids' hands. I wanted them to be actually utilizing the technology so that they can see how it works, how they can be creating it, so then they, in turn, can be our future um, creates of whatever is going to be coming around then. So one of the first pieces I got was called a bristle box. And a bristle box is a very preliminary piece of technology that the kids work with, in which they are using materials that they can actually find around their house. So I purchased these kits, but they can actually then in turn, I'll give them directions, they can produce it with materials at home using a toothbrush, a battery, and a little motor that is a, um, a similar motor that you would find under page or something that vibrates. They hook it up together with, with um, wires, put it down in place, and then it, but as it vibrates, it moves across. So this introduces the kids to what's going on behind the scenes when, with the technology that they're using. They can see with this that there's a lot of different things that they can do. If 
they change where the motor is positioned on it. They will change the angle that their little bristle bot is moving in. They can put different other features on it. There is pipe cleaners on this, which will help with balance. So it puts them in the, into the driving of producing different pieces of technology. So that's our first piece that we have. And then I also purchased some V-Bots. <laughs> V-Bots are a little type of robotic. <coughs> and this gets the kids into thinking in the same brain as a programmer. These little robots get programmed on the top here. It teaches the students directionals and it teaches them sequencing to see what order they need their robot to go into to achieve their goals. Um, this is a good intro for the students with robotics because I put the kids in the different roles of what you're doing when you're producing technology, where first you have your problem that you want to solve, then you have your programmer who decides what's going to happen in order to do it, and then you have the actual program that's going to pull out what you've programmed in together to see if they actually met their goal. So the kids really are enjoying using that. And then we get a little bit more techno. We have our Spiros, which are a little bit more of an intense robot. This gets programmed with iPads or iPhones, or iPods, sorry. And the kids do coding with this. Well, with the V-Bots, they do the programming up top. It's just forward, back, right, left. With this one, the coding gets a lot more technical in it and that they can program their robot to react to different environmental, for example, from sound to if it bumped into something, to if you threw it, how it's going to react to it. So this gets a lot more in depth in as far as what their programming is doing on that. So that's the Spiros. And then I have the Makey Makeys. <laughs> the Makey Makeys are little circuit boards. And the circuit board attaches with alligator clips to your computer, and it can replace your keyboard and your touchpad and your mouse. So it again teaches the students exactly what's going on. So instead of just using the mouse and controlling what's going on on the screen, they can actually be putting together the materials to do it on their own. This example right here is first the students had to find out, well, what type of materials will actually conduct? This is not every material the conductor. Then we decided we were going to try Play-Doh. Play-Doh did work. They're using Play-Doh as the bongos to per play a program that shows up on the screen. So there's a lot of ways that they can change around with this as a part of, as taking everyday items, connecting it to a computer, and seeing what they can do with that. The example down the bottom, they can show you can have bananas. Bananas can be a keyboard, and then they can play music there. So again, totally open-ended with what the students can do with that one. And then we have Little Bits. Little Bits are little kits, and the kits contain little blocks. And each block is a piece of circuitry. Each circuitry performs a, cer a certain role depending on what the students are trying to put together. The blue bots are your energy source. The pink bots are your input, so that's where the students are involved in it, whether it's a slider, for um, controlling the speed of something. Um, and then you have your motor, and that's connected to whatever it is you want it to do. So there can be anything on it from, yeah, I need two hands. <laughs> but um, this is again, it's totally open-ended in what the students are gonna be able to produce with it. I got it, yeah. Um, they're creating. The biggest thing I wanted with the makerspace is there's no rules of what they can do. They're not given specific directions. Okay, now you're going to produce this. They're given the tools to create and see what it is they come up with. So it's a very simple little thing that they do. This one has a motor that spins. There's another motor that has a fan. So again, the tools are there. Their kids are seeing how when you put the pieces together, what it's going to end up producing for them. So that's the making babies. Oh, sorry, that was a little bit. But I didn't want our makerspace to just be technology because there's a lot of other ways that you can create. So in addition to those technology pieces, I also have origami. I have, was able to purchase a lot of pieces of origami paper and some books so the kids can get some ideas of things they can create with origami. 
I have eye stop motion, which we do are fortunate enough to have some iPads, and they can do slow motion video. And these are some of the pieces that we use for that where they can change the, um, make the move into step by step and produce some eye stop motion video. We also have a green screen, so like when you watch the weather and they have the screen behind them, we have a green screen in the um, library also where the kids can create video. We have some very no-tech things like the marble run. That's very elementary technology, and let's see how we can get this to work. And I also have the connect, which is also building, and some engineering there. I have duct tape. Who doesn't love duct tape? Right? I have a variety of different things of duct tape and some books also that go along with this, so the kids can be creating with duct tape. And then I have a 3D Google pen also, where you put filaments in, and the kids can create with that also. So, oh, and of course, being a library too, I was able to purchase lots and lots of books that can support all of these materials to give the kids ideas to try to get them sparked and get going. So the so now that you have an idea of what the materials are, the way it's going to be used is, because I told you in the beginning, a maker is someone who creates with a variety of materials. These materials are all available to the students. So the student who is really passionate about coding can pick up one of the robots, encode the robot, and learn some computer programming. While the student who is really passionate about arts and crafts, they have the duct tape and some books available so they can be creating with duct tape. The materials are there for the kids. They can come in, pick whatever is their passion at that day, use the materials, and see what they can create and come up with. It all supports our big focus on STEM and STEAM, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. So. And I like the ending here that a maker space is a place that's dedicated to creating, making, and idea generating. So I'm very, very fortunate. Thank you very much, Scrap Yes, because it was very exciting to be able to give this opportunity to our kids. So thank you, thank you. Thank you. The last category is called the outdoor classroom. And it includes two projects, one at Tea Ticket School and one at Falmouth High School. We all know that the world outside the classroom as well as inside is filled with opportunities to learn. Um, and these two projects um, demonstrate that. So let me invite up Lynn Van Attic, Harry Shanahan, Stacey Boudreau to talk about the Kinder Labyrinth, and then Jane Baker. Thank you so much. We are a group of teachers from the Tea Ticket Elementary School, and our project was called the Kindergarten Labyrinth of Learning. It came about with a lot of help and technology from Mrs. Boudreau because I don't know how to do any of this. <laughs> and a lot of support from Jane Baker, who is here as a parent and a form and a mentor and a um, friend that has really helped us to get organized and get started with our idea and give us the confidence to move forward with it. So our idea, our idea was to create an outdoor learning space for our classrooms that got our children outdoors and out of our, in, our inside learning. Um, we want to, just gonna get our, um, We wanted to have them outside observing nature getting their hands dirty, uh, learning about how things changed over time, whether it's themselves or plants or animals. Um, and to do that, we came up with a plan to create from an outdated kindergarten space this rendition of an outdoor learning center. Um, Focally is the labyrinth, which the FEF was wonderful about coming forward and helping us to be able to provide. It included two planting spaces, this an ABC garden that had come about by a conversation with myself and Stacy Boudreau many years ago. And on the other side of the garden, there are some planting beds where we have planted fruits and vegetables with the help of the kindergarten students for the last two years. The picnic tables were another part of it that were built by the 7th and 8th grade 
STEM classes at the Lawrence High School, or Lawrence Junior High School. And the seating area is a um, outdoor learning group space that was meticulously put together by the Falmouth DPW. So we had a lot of people that were involved in all of the um, elements of this. And in the far back side, you see some birdhouses there. You can see a better picture on some of the posters that we have on the side. They were built to resemble some of the historic buildings in town, one of which is the Falmouth uh, Tea Ticket Elementary School, where the um, garden is, and one of them is the Falmouth uh, Police Department, uh, Fire Department, excuse me, and we actually had a bird, a barn swallow, move in very shortly after it went up, and we had a lot of fun with the kindergartners watching them build in their nests, despite the fact that we were out there right among them, we would stand still, and we would watch this bird go back and forth, picking up dirt, picking up wood chips, picking up mulch, and she built her nest, and over time, we saw and heard the babies that were born in there and saw a few other um, interactions between the barn swallow and some of the sparrows that are a little bit more aggressive <laughs> in the area. Um, so what our plan was to, was to um, involve as many groups as we possibly could. This is a picture of the perennial garden that has some paving stones that were created by a high school student along with the um, custodial staff at school. They have embedded in them some beading that gives all of the alphabet letters. This is the rainbow garden that was modeled after uh, Lois Ellert's book, Planting a Rainbow, uh, and some of our students planting some of the flowers that we had in our garden area. This is a sunflower house that we plant every year with our incoming uh, preschool students. And uh, when they come to kindergarten, they plant it in May, and when they come to kindergarten in the fall, the sunflowers are there to greet them. Uh, it's pretty exciting when the kids see that, just that in and of itself, how they've changed and how the world has changed over time. Um, but the goal was to get a labyrinth in the center. And we tried several different ideas, or we considered several different ideas on how to create a labyrinth, from just rocks placed in a path that we created to some live plants. And then we were, we, again, with the encouragement of Jane Baker, applied for an FEF grant, and you guys came through with funding to be able to make a permanent structure that stayed um, in our garden space. This is where we started. It had been a playground at one point, but the equipment was either outdated or destroyed locally by some neighbors, um, and it was removed. So we proposed to put together this project. You can see the beginnings of the labyrinth. It was a kit that was purchased from the labyrinth company, which is located in Connecticut. We tried several different, or we considered several different options, including cutting the stones ourselves. I had a garden volunteer that I worked with when I was at Mullen Hall School, her, whose name was um, Suzanne Apollanas. She runs the artistic garden design, and she stepped forward with her crew to assemble the garden um, labyrinth for us, along with some very patient parent volunteers and family members. Um, it was a pretty easy process to put it together once the area was uh, prepared properly. And you can see how the kit comes together just by placing the stones in the rightful spaces. It was a pretty interesting engineering process for all of us and to see how, how you could take people who teach kindergarten and gym and we could create something like this with some pretty skilled um, laborers, if you will. Uh, there's the finished product. And it took three days for us to create it. And you can see the, over the summer, the, over the summer <laughs> and the sweltering heat, um, there's the um, crew from, and Suzanne's uh, group from the Artistic Garden Design. And then we were finished. But our job now was to create some grassy areas where we could actually enjoy the space out there and not be in the mud. So we had several very generous um, people who joined in with FEF and donated funds or donated product. Um, there you see us, 10 yards, of, uh, 10 yards of soil we moved with four or five teachers. <laughs> and I might say not very successfully, we had a very bad <laughs> drainage problem because we really didn't know what we were doing at that point, but we had some very um, supportive parents that stepped forward and helped us solve that problem along with, again, some family members. You can see here the um, hydro seeding that went down to help bring the grass back to make the labyrinth really pop. 
And one of the things I didn't mention, here's the, the barn swallow that moved into the birdhouse. One of the things that I didn't mention is on the outside border of the labyrinth, there are some paving stones that were painted by the third and fourth grade students at T-Ticket School after they had had a little bit of um, information from Lucy Helfrich from the 300 Committee. She came and talked to them about some of the ants and plants and animals that live in the area, and then they drew their pictures and then transferred it onto the stone, and that's a permanent border around the outside edge. So as the kids are walking the labyrinth, they can learn about some of the animals and plants that live in the area. There's our bond swallow again. We're kind of proud of him. Uh, there's a long view of the garden spaces. <coughs> And you can see this is our dedication ceremony that we had this last spring and some of the kindergartners that stood outside and sang some um, songs. Here they are using the labyrinth, which we would go out, Mrs. Boudreau and I would go out in the morning with our children and walk the labyrinth and give them an opportunity to see um, how the path doesn't lead you sometimes as you expect. It, has a calming way of, of bringing you back down, teaching you a little bit of patience, and a little bit of discovery as well. We had children remarking and even writing about the labyrinth that they were surprised that the path brought them to where it did. Um, so it was, it was a great project to work on. We're pretty proud of the fact that we were able to bring that original space to this. And Mrs. Boudreau has created a Facebook page if you are interested in seeing some of the progression and some more detailed pictures, there are some information on the posters in the back, along with some newspaper articles um, telling you, you know, a little bit about the process of what we've tried to do. And you can see we've painted on some of the papers a, a big thank you to the FEF, because we do appreciate the support uh, that you gave to us and to this project. So thanks. I'm Jane Baker, and apparently my cold medicine is worn off, so apologies for simples. I was the fool kind of sneezing over on the side earlier, sorry. Uh, I, I'm, the art, I'm a studio art teacher at Falmouth High School, and I've been teaching high school for a good 20 years or so. I went to Falmouth High School, um, but I've been at Falmouth High for the last 12 or so, and the Falmouth Education Foundation has kindly funded a number of grants that I put together over the last Oh, 10 or so years. So, um, so many of those, the more recent ones, have been pro projects where I've asked the students to go outside. And let me just, you know what, while I'm talking, excuse me, I've got two things to show you. So while I'm talking, I'm gonna have this playing in the background before it plays because each slide is two seconds because I jammed four projects into two and a half minutes. <laughs> um, I'll just let you know that for all of the projects, where we go outside, it, it generally starts with a big crowd of teenagers getting them to listen to a guest speaker who teaches them something about something that I don't always know things about, such as seal biology or ornithology or things like that. So they have readings, they have guest speakers, and then there's the actual experience where we go out, and then the art making, and then there's generally art shows or more than one art show, and then a follow-up experience, et cetera, et cetera. So, those are all going to be going like this while I kind of blather on a bit. Um, anyway, so this is the first project back in 2012. And I call it This Land is Your Land because I'm hokey and I yeah. <laughs> like it. Um, so in the art class at Falmouth High School, I have notes here because I tend to talk in tangents and I just have notes. Um, when you're in one of my art classes, I teach studio art one, two, and then basically three, four, and five, but five being AP. And the first couple levels, you're learning medium processes, how to use ink, how to draw from observation, things like that. So medium processes governs the first two levels. But when you get to the advanced art classes, that's when we're really about portfolio building and community art experiences. And 
for me, uh, one, one thing about art class, whether or not you're going to be an art major in college, it's just good to have that extra skill because I truly believe that art is a form of visual communication, just like writing is communication and speaking and singing and things like that. Art making is a communication skill that you may have learned in first or second or third grade and loved it, but then somebody told you that your pony looked like a goat and then you felt stupid and then you stopped doing it. And so by the time I get them in high school, they all think they can't draw. I can't draw, I can't draw. Well, you, you all actually can, and I should actually make you stay here and draw today and show you that you can draw. So when they get to the higher levels, higher levels, um, that's when I actually ask them to get out and look at the world because um, a lot of them, they just want to look at their phone, not because they're lazy, but because that's the first thing they look at. And so if I give an assignment to say, we're going to do Cape Cod landscapes, they're just going to get their phones and type in Cape Cod landscapes and go from there. And there's no, there's no learning in that. So um, basically what I ask them to do is to, you know, high schoolers, they have a need for perfection and realism. These are all my notes, the things I'm thinking of. Um, and, and also, if, if you just tell a student to be creative, they're going to draw you a silly eyeball or sunset or things like that, things that don't really have a connection to their own lives. So by forcing them to go out and experiencing all these things, um, it, it immediately has that connection to them and they can see the world around them. So that's, that's, essentially, that's essentially what I do. So these are all different projects. This is the most recent one last year. Uh, where we called, I called it Drawing on Common Ground, and that's where we went to Peterson Farm, learned from the 300 Committee, and did all these artworks. And then, okay. <laughs> so then we went to Harvard, the grant-funded uh, trip to Harvard, where they drew dead animals, and then we met up with Boston Arts Academy, looked at their conservation land, and then the kids made a lot of really good art. And that's another thing, they make this art, which because it has, which I, it's corny to say it has a soul, but because they're connected to it, they make this beautiful stuff, and then, they enter in competitions, and so they win first prizes in you know, the congressional art shows and the scholastic art shows and all these things that then go on their college trips or not doing <laughs> other things. And it's, it's, it's just a great experience. And, and we have these, anyway, we have these opportunities to exhibit and these opportunities to make crazy things. Like, a, I don't know if you saw the 14 foot long seal, which was entered in a, the Appearances Art Festival, which is a grown up ecological art show that happens in P-Town and we entered it, well we told them that it was a high school class, but they still, it got juried in to a grown up show. And my, my husband and my friend Ray Burke drove it to P-Town in a big truck and it was in the show and the kids were able, the FEF, so think about it, the FEF pays for the materials, it pays for the students to take the field trips to make the art, it pays for the guest speakers, um, the FEF pays for the students to then go to P-Town and see there are in a grown-up art setting, and it's pretty amazing. And also, I don't know if you noticed in the second and a half it was up there, but they meet professional artists and all sorts of good stuff. Um, so the other thing that I will show you, if I can get out of this screen, is something that Ryan Weber put together from our last trip. Um, oh, I got it. Thank you. So the project that's going on right now is. Um, it's a migration-based project, and basically, I come up with projects in the middle of, I don't even know what, they're just connections of things. So the latest project was a collaboration where David Vier and I had talked about Louis Agassiz two years ago about another project, and then that sparked something where two Labor Days ago, I, I like to go out to Devil's Foot Island on Labor Day, just to kind of stand on the farthest rock and get ready for school. <laughs> and it's just what, it's what I do, just to kind of breathe in and just be like, here we go, because I love it and it's great, but I have two little children and I also love to be with them, so it's the shift. So uh, that, that time that we were on Devil's Foot, there was maybe a thousand turns that were on their way south. And I'm standing there with my children, like first of all, kind of worried that they're gonna get hurt because the turns were everywhere, but also just like, this is amazing. And realizing that so many of my students will never see this because well, they're busy, they're like playing field hockey or they're watching Netflix or they're <laughs> on their phones. So I've tried to think of a way to get them, a, to get an opportunity for them to see it. So I came up with the idea of, well, a bus costs this much, I wonder how much a boat costs. And so <laughs> I contacted Mr. TG and he thought that would be a great idea and he offered to 
get us a boat. And so next thing you know, we have too many students, we need two boats. So <laughs> anyway, it was an awesome day. The kids went out to Cadillac and Penikis, thanks to David Vieira, who was able to get us permission to get onto Penikis. And the Penikis had a trust. It was a lot of maneuvering, but in the end, it was an awesome day. And uh, Ryan Weber was with us documenting it. And so he kindly made this awesome little movie, which is sadly me talking too much again. But <laughs> if you could see, this, this gives you an idea of what, OK, perfect, like two minutes. But we're here to see the creatures migrating through. And the students are taking notes on those things. They're writing about it. They're drawing the landscape. They're painting the landscape. And we're just trying to get them to experience uh, a part of Cape Cod that you wouldn't normally see. I mean, I grew up in Falmouth, but I've, you know, I've never been to Penn Keats. And unless you get a chance to come out here, you wouldn't necessarily be able to see the, you know, this, this kind of Cape Cod. Because FDF has been key in, in so many projects that we've done over the years and getting the kids outdoors and getting them to look at nature and not at the internet for their sources. Mm -hmm. And that's an important way to learn things and to remember things. And one of the main reasons why we're here on Penikeets is because of Lewis Agassi. This whole philosophy of study nature and not books, because that's uh, it's important to actually physically look at something to reflect on it, as opposed to reading about it or hearing about it or seeing it in a picture that you found on Google. Uh, it's just that it's not meaningful. It doesn't have any soul. I drew a few landscapes because like that one right right there is very full. So we're kind of from higher up point um, because I like the way that the uh, on both of them the shoreline curves along with the sand. get to Cuddy Hunk, I'd say things start getting interesting. Yeah. Um, just that Cuddy Hunk is pretty interesting, and so is Panikis. Uh, they're both really different, I would say. Um, um, I chose to write about the one short word that I saw because I really wasn't expecting to see anything since there's not really many short words out here right now. But I did end up seeing one when I was alone on the beach and everyone else had gone back, and I thought it was kind of cool that it was just me and the short bird walking along the beach together since no one else had seen it. So I wrote about my isolate, isolated event with the short bird and how I felt about that. I, I would have loved to have had this opportunity at the Cedar Summit High School to come out uh, with one of my either art classes or English classes. Uh, I had actual philosophy, I hadn't until I returned from college, which is the first time I came out to Penkeys. Uh, but I think it's important as, uh, as these young people are so plugged into technology today and, and learning technology, to be able to get out into a wildlife sanctuary like this and to really uh, take value of it, whether it's through writing, journaling, you know, through artwork, uh, but to really be able to car carry on the Aldo Leopold land ethic. And that's uh, a lot of what today is for me. It's not only the art and the English classes, but making sure that we extend that land ethic to the next generation. Kids are going to be making a lot of artworks and writing from this. And then they'll be having a number of art shows, and the FDF is also sponsoring. Um, they're going to they're going to be entering this work in a competition down Cape, and so part of the grant will pay for us to go down Cape and see the work in the competition. And the Falmouth Education Foundation is so great that they give us they give us money to come up with these ideas, to bring the kids places, to make high school interesting, but also fun. I mean, it is fun to be on an island for a day. Some of the uh, some of the things no, <laughs> some of the things that I see are are things that could be uh, accessed and may have an influence on classes and students beyond those in the immediate classroom that that uh, is only supervised by the person who won the grant. 
So is there some mechanism whereby those other things that are specific to that particular classroom, the benefits that might be extended, is there a mechanism by which they can be extended to the rest of the schools? It's so interesting that you asked that question because as FEF talks about ways to grow and expand, one of the things that we talk about is replicability. You know, what's the mechanism for spreading the word if something's working in a classroom? How do we share what we've learned with other classrooms and other schools? So no, there isn't a mechanism except, you know, teacher word of mouth, you know, Jane helping Lynn and the crew, for example. But we are talking about putting that mechanism in place in the coming year. Yes. So how many of the follow students? Follow-up question. Yeah, follow-up question related to music. Um, uh, are there instruments available in the various classrooms in the elementary schools? Are there? Is there a cache of instruments that the students can use? So the the short answer to that is yes. All the schools have. Um, uh, their own, and this is a real word, an instrumentarium. Um, I had to convince my principal that that is a real word. Um, I don't know if it works in Scrabble or not, but uh, we all have whatever we've kind of built up in our own ways. Um, every elementary school does have in, uh, barred instruments, which, which would be the xylophone. Some of them have newer ones than others. Uh, some of them have a few more than others, but we all have enough where you have at least a half class set um, of working instruments. So some, and to be perfectly honest, many of them are 30 years old or more. So they've, uh, they've stood the test of time and they still work, but they need some uh, TLC. So we have those, which are actually a very, very large part of how we teach. Uh, and it's an actual, the method is called the Orff method, which was Carl Orff who did Carmina Burana. And, um, but it wasn't him who actually got into all these things. It gets into the whole thing about Kate Moore and all that. So if you want to look that up or you want to talk to me about that later, we can talk about that. But uh, drums are something that I was looking to build. So that's why I wrote the grant for the, the Tubanos. Uh, all the schools have a certain amount of those types of uh, drums, but some of them have less than others. Um, and there are uh, the auxiliary percussion instruments. So mainly in the elementary schools, we're using percussion instruments, um, typically not the wind instruments, except for band because of the sharing of germs and all that. So does that... So my, my dream is, is being fulfilled. I have very close to the instrumentarium that I really want that puts Falmouth schools in with the best mu uh, towns, with the best music programs. That's really what my goal is, to be able to offer all the things that all the best towns do, because we are in that we're, we're part of the club. Thank you. If there aren't any more questions, um, I just wanted to thank all of you um, for your, the gift of your participation in this very, very exciting work. Thanks to our presenters again. Um, Kathy, Rodriguez can you, um, just came in. Those are her beautiful murals back there. So if you want to stop by and chat with her on your way out, that would be great. Um, thank you.